Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you had a fantastic lunch. For those of you that don't know me, my name's Neil Gavin. I'm your chair for this afternoon. Quite an interesting session to be chairing and actually forms a nice bridge from the session I had the pleasure of chairing yesterday, which was, and I don't know how many of you were there, I'll do a sh uh, show of hands in a minute, was Trish Yule's uh, session on data analytics yesterday, where we kind of went into the nuts and bolts of um, how we can all be despite what um, Marcia Connor said yesterday about not being experts anymore. Um, Trish was quite, is quite clearly the expert in that area, but we can all be, without too much effort, experts in data analytics. What's exciting about this session today is we've got three fantastic speakers who are bringing to the table how that works in practice, what they're doing in business and the leverage that they are able to make from use of their uh, learning data, their predictive data, and actually analyzing that stuff in detail to make a difference to their learning function, their learning uh, systems, their learning outcomes. And it's all about the business. So it should always be that we're using this data to improve what we do and improve our business performance. First up, I have uh, Laurie Niles to speak. And uh, Laurie is a senior learning strategist now, and well, have been for some time, haven't you? She's <laughs> um, got over 20 years L&D experience in many different industries. Specializes in large-scale digital learning transformations and helping companies to use data to navigate through the ambiguity of change. So Laurie's up first. Um, I won't be standing to introduce each speaker as they come up, so heads up. Next will then be Nick Coley from Evans Cycles. Evan, now, obviously, Evans Cycles is a retail business, so for Nick, it's all about the data being used to transform business outcomes again in the retail sector. And then our last speaker will be Dr. Hannah Gore. Now, if any of you were at the Learning Awards last week or were paying any attention on social media to the Learning Awards, you'll be aware that, that Hannah won the Learning Professional, she got the Bronze Award for Learning Professional of the Year at the Learning Awards last year. She, she's coming to us with our fantastic track record and an acknowledgement by her peers in the industry as well. Um, she works for a, a company called Solera, a reach into 26 countries, and again, it's about how she's using that data, what that data means to the individual, what that data means to them in transforming the business. Ladies and gentlemen, that's your speakers. I'm going to get out of the way and hand over firstly to Laurie Niles. Thank you, everyone, and thank you so much for, for joining here today. Uh, we've had some fantastic speakers, so it's very much so an honor that you selected uh, this session to come to, mostly because it is one near and dear to my heart. Um, it's uh, one that I've been working with in detail for probably about three years, and it's something that uh, I'm just very passionate about, so thank you again. I'm sorry I don't have a nice accent. I'm from Toronto, Canada. <laughs> Not too jet-lagged right now, but uh, hopefully I'll, get, uh, I'll say the words all correctly. So data-fueled learning, um, you don't need this slide about me. Why do I like data-fueled learning? Well, this is a bit of a gruesome slide. I often talk about the learning approach of an autopsy. Someone comes to you, says they need a learning intervention, and you say, do some performance consulting, and say, yeah, that sounds about right. I'm thinking e-learning module, thinking uh, a couple of videos, we'll put it out there, and, uh, and then we'll see how it goes, and we'll do the autopsy. And the autopsy afterwards is in the form of you know, our smiley sheets, our evaluations, our completions, our test scores. And those are all good things. We need to measure the impact of our learning. We have to make sure it's business impact, that people are satisfied with it. But my uh, thesis statement basically is if we do a bit more in the diagnosis place, if we start to understand some of the preferences of our learners, we start to get into a position where we can make a better diagnosis and ultimately make a better prescription that's going to lead to better outcomes. So let's take a look at what I mean by this. 
These are all cues that our learners are telling us in digital form. When we're in the classroom, and I taught, believe it or not, juvenile delinquents, that's what they called them back in the day, 20 years ago, I could tell from my learners when they were engaged and not. I got so savvy, I could even tell the difference between a real request to use the washroom and one that's just, I'm gonna go smoke a joint in the backyard. So that's how precise you get. But now, when I launch something, I can't see, does that learner have Instagram open? Are they just letting it play? Are they engaged? Are they reading every word? I have no idea. But what I can do is get a few things, and these are very interesting clues. The downloads, mobile versus desktop, what's the, what's the ratio? Likes, drop-offs, I love these. These are the people who have logged into something and just flat out walked away. Comments, can I aggregate them to find out sentiment scores? Trends, what are people searching for? What are they going on their intranet to look for? What's crowding to the top? And all of these could become something that I like to refer to as digital body language. A very fancy term that I cannot claim credit for, but I worked for the man who did. <laughs> His name is Steve Woods, and he actually used this in marketing. And I know L&D professionals, so they hear marketing, but we're not marketers. You're not, and I'll explain the differences. But he, they were using digital body language to be able to determine when people were most likely to purchase and when they were engaging with a particular product. And what was interesting about that is they could get so precise that in one case with Target, this is a department store in the US, they, predict, they started sending pamphlets to a 15-year-old girl to say congratulations on your pregnancy. Her dad did not know. That's how precise they could get based on her search terms and what she was looking at, not even purchasing. That's how scary. I don't want to get that scary in L&D, but imagine if we were in a case where we could offer that type of precision for content based on actual needs. It'd be a very different world. So basically, every drop-off, click, or share is the one they're telling us their likes and dislikes. It's just simply in a digital format. But this is the caveat. Um, when I first put out my ebook, people misinterpreted and said, and it's entirely on me, misinterpreted that high engagement, what people are clicking on, means it's, it's good. And I'm like, no. Okay, high engagement does not equal good learning quality. And I'll give you a perfect example that makes me laugh. Time Magazine every day, or every year, does a person of the year cover, and you've probably seen it in the international edition. And people vote on this. And generally speaking, it's a philanthropist, it's a politician, it's somebody who's done something very important in the world. In this year, well, Never underestimate the power of millions of 13-year-old girls who are big fans of K-pop. And as you can see, they voted uh, BTS, which I have no idea what it is. Those are parents you might know. And this was what they voted as person of the year. So high engagement does not necessarily mean good content. No offense to K-pop, but I don't think they changed the world. I think we can all maybe agree on that. And I mentioned before that there is there is overlap between marketing and learning, okay? Both of us are trying to give our audiences information with the intent to change a behavior. We want to give people information so that they adopt a new software system or perhaps they um, you know, use a new coaching model. <coughs> and with marketing, they are also trying to do the same thing with the intent for you to buy their product or engage with their product, right? We both have the short attention spans and the face-to-face -face relationship is gone. But marketing, I would say, has weathered the storm much better. As I mentioned before, they have, they have systems that, that get the analytics to such precision. We don't have that yet. We have the LMS or the, the LXP, whatever the cool kids are calling it right now. But there are two approaches. And this really interested me when I was working at a company that was with marketing automation. When they started at the content design phase, what they did is they looked at data analytics for trends. Okay? And they started to create this map of the, their target audience. And they designed the content directly to those preferences. Okay? And they would monitor it as, as they launched the content. They would say, you know, in two hours, how is it trending? What can we do? How do we pivot? In learning, we're very linear, right? We do our performance consulting, do our learning objectives, you know, performance outcomes, all that. Design, evaluate, and linear. This is, this is the autopsy approach. Now, we have similarities, as I've outlined there, but we are not the same. And this is what I want to stress, because a lot of people think if we just do what marketing does, we're going to have you know, performance outcomes. No, we are not. Those things are similar. However, the difference is, in marketing, marketing is going to give you 
everything that you indicate you want. It's going to give you videos of happy babies if it makes you purchase something. It's going to show you puppies and kittens if it gets engagement. They'll do anything, right, to get that, to get that awareness. In learning, ours is a little bit more difficult. In learning, um, we have to teach things like coaching, policy, software. Definitely not as cute or fluffy as we see on the other side. So we can take some lessons from marketing, but we cannot be the same. And in fact, if we just gave people what we like, we would end up in this situation, which I'm sure you all remember about Bodie McBoatface. Although I do have to say, anytime you decide to put a poll out to the people to decide what to name something, I think this was pretty predictable to happen. But I did like Bodie McBoatface. So the phrase that I use is that, unlike marketing, we need to hide the vegetables. Within their, within their meal. And this is where I talk about some, some savvy ways that you can use data. To fit it into workflow, look for trends. I love trends. Make better design decisions. And I know that Nick's going to speak specifically, case study deeper on this. And you can performance consult faster. Learn to make data your superpower. Because there's nothing like data to, to fight a CFO or a CEO. It's like jujitsu. So the first thing that I look at is, where's their digital pub? I think we did ourselves a disservice when we put learning on one single platform. Find out where, the, I know why we did it, is because we had to you know, track it and everything, but now find out where the digital pub is. Where are the, your learners already congregating? It may be someplace like on Slack, I hate to say, it might be on WhatsApp, it may be even an internet portal, SharePoint, probably not SharePoint, but I said it. Um, where are they going? And where's the time, day of week when they are most likely to be on it, okay? So are you gonna find them, the, where are you gonna find them there? That's important because this is the window for when you want to launch your content. It's as simple as that. Why put it someplace new where it's difficult for people to get to? Or at the very least, put a widget on one of these pages. We found the most popular page on, um, on one of our intranet uh, uh, at a company I was consulting with, and the most popular page was the, um, the menu list at the canteen. <laughs> that was where everybody went every day. So we put a widget on it and said, hey, you've got 20 minutes for lunch, why not do some learning? and our engagement rate shot up 30% of people coming into our LMS. All right. So it's just a way to get people into, into, your, uh, into your place. Use data to identify trends. Okay, bad word coming up here, and I actually blanked it out. So this is uses of the F word online, on social media, <laughs> from medium.com, so I'm not saying the word. And as you can see here, we had a big spike happen in November of 2016. <laughs> I think everyone knows what happens. But what's interesting about that and why I like looking at search words and what people are looking for is because that is an ear to the ground. It is a stethoscope telling me what is important to people at that instant. And it helps me then go back to stakeholders and say, look, people are searching for this. Is this important to you? Okay. Is this something that we need? And in which case, we need to react and we need to react quickly. So that's why I love those, those terms. Highest ranking hashtags, if you see those things happening, download shares and likes, look at the comments, read the comments, engage with them. Those are other places to get, to get data. But again, high engagement, just because everyone was using the F word does not mean it was a good thing. <laughs> but this is, this is the data. And again, make data your performance consulting superpower. These are the seven pieces of data. I've, I've already mentioned some of these. But when I go in and talk about these with um, stakeholders, all of a sudden, when they come to me, usually already with a, a solution in mind, I want an e-learning course, it needs to be mobile, it needs to be this, I can go through with this and say, OK, well, wait a second. This is the digital body language of your company. This is what we see. And you start to create that, that map. And that becomes a very easy way to streamline those conversations. And if I really can't convince them, what I will do is what I call A-B testing. I'll put content out, small piece, never design the whole program, put it out and see how content plays. Then I go back to them with the day and say, can we make some more informed decisions rather than just deciding? Okay. And here's an interesting one. Uh, this came from Degreed. It's actually not published, but if you find Todd Tauber at the Degreed booth, this is actually how 3 million users consume data or consume content on their platform. And what interested me is you can see 63% are not courses. And in fact, only 6% are paid content libraries. So I found that this is, this is very interesting. And this is what I also pull out too when I'm making the, the case for maybe not a course, maybe let's look at some resources. 
And finally, this is the type of, of insights that, that, that you start to see. So you start to be able to see geographically what these people are doing, create that heat map, and bring that back before you make any design decisions. And here's just a little bit of a, uh, of a, of a story, case studies actually happened to me. I had a stakeholder who came to me and said, we, want, we need content on, on this topic. It's absolutely critical, can't function without it. Well, it turns out it was number 152 in the searches. <laughs> but the top three were actually critical to the business. So we were able to have a much more informed conversation and save a lot of budget and time. So lastly, this is data-driven learning design, and this is something that I specialize in. Really, at the start of your project, see what data you can get to discover insights. And it doesn't just mean what's on your LMS, as I've shown. See how you respond to that language, and then monitor and pivot. Build pieces of it and keep changing. And lastly, this is a, just a slide that I really quite enjoy. And this is um, a, a professor who I think actually really got the, you know what clickbait is? You know, where you put, you'll never guess what Jennifer Aniston did when she found out she was pregnant. Well, she's not pregnant, but you click on it anyway. Uh, she did clickbait for her course syllabus. And I thought, this was, I thought this was a really ingenious way. So I think there's ways that we can really think about what marketing does, but also being very clear about what is learning and not throwing away good learning design and see if we can marry the two. Thank you very much. We've just got a quick laptop swap over, and then we've got Nick Coley up next. Hello, everybody. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm Nick. Good to see you all. Uh, from Evan Cycles, and hopefully I'll be able to go through some uh, instances that I've had where we started to use, or as a team, we started to use data within our business. So before I crack on with the, the data stuff, uh, I just want to give a bit of context, because I'm not a data-driven person. In fact, my boss found this quite funny that I was standing up here talking about data, but don't let that fool you. So when I was little, I, uh, I, well, I didn't even think I'd be an L&D professional. In fact, I thought I'd be uh, a Thundercat or a Transformer or something like that. But as I uh, realized that wasn't going to happen, I worked through my career. I found that I always gravitated towards a role where I was supporting people or helping people learn or coaching or anything that involved supporting somebody get better at what they do. And that's kind of got me to where, where I am now. Um, but what's really interesting is that's only part of the story. The real sort of shift with us has been actually what we've started to ask all of our colleagues within our business. And the, um, there we go. The, the question that we've started asking is, all right, so what do you need to be better? And as a result of that, we're, uh, we're kind of doing it ourselves with our own team. And we're starting to ask ourselves, right, what do we need to be better? What do we need to have better conversations within the business, to have more impact in what we're doing? And as a result, we've found that using data is really starting to change the way we do things, change the conversations that we're having, and allowing us to kind of show the impact that we're having. So the, the three bits that I just want to kind of cover off with you guys today and share from my experiences are around design, so how are we using data to impact how we design our learning solutions, uh, how we're linking it to our business goals as well. So we're taking the data from our platform uh, we probably all have access within our organizations to a huge amount of data. So it's working out what data we can link with those two, the correlations between them, and then we can look at what the impact's coming out there. And then the last one is, I suppose, really the one that's really, really exciting me. It's the conversations that we can now have. Uh, this is more around how we're connecting with people within the business, how we're having genuinely better conversations. And I was in one of the sessions yesterday where they were talking about... <clears throat> Uh, learning leadership, and the point came up around having a seat at the table. And I think when I go through this, it, you know, to have that seat, you kind of need to talk the language as well. So I'll come on to that right at the end. So 2017, February, so two years ago, uh, we took the plunge, uh, less of a diving into the water and more of a getting to the top board and dive bombing off the top. So we jumped into e-learning world. We worked with a company called NetEx, who supported us in terms of the platform. We worked with a company called Video Arts, uh, who provided us with some of our content, but not everything. So our primary aim for getting 
uh, an e-learning platform was to share product training with our colleagues. We've got 60 stores across the country. We've got around 800 retail colleagues. So it's how do we get all of the information out to them? So we, we went to work on this. We created modules on bicycles, on clothing, on parts, accessories. These intended to have a generic introduction to colleagues on the products, and then we'd add in brand-specific training on top of that. And the interesting thing really came when we, we kind of plugged in Google Analytics to our platform, and our platform gives us great insight in terms of what's happening within that, um, that module or that course, or you know, we've got feedback on what people like. But the really interesting stuff came from when we plugged Google Analytics into it. And what we found was we're able to look at how many users visit the site, what day they visit the site, how many sessions that user's having, how long are they on the site for, and what day do they visit. And to, to go back to what Laurie was mentioning, we used to launch all of our uh, content on Friday afternoon, ready for the weekend. You know, we, we finished work, we went home um, at the weekend, the stores were open. And we started to look at this, we're like, right, hang on, majority of people are going on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, around about lunchtime. So one quick, simple thing that we did was we changed the day that we launched our new content to a Monday morning, and lo and behold, we started to see the impact of that. So the data that we've got from that, and look, don't get me wrong, I'm not a Google Analytics kind of person. Uh, I know a bit about it, but I listen to people on the same floor as me at work, and they go to training courses on this and everything, so it's fantastic. But the really interesting thing that we kind of learned was how long people are on that site. And this is just one snippet of the things that we looked at. And when we launched our platform, this is sort of the numbers of how many people were um, visiting the site and how many sessions they were having. Our session or our video length was five minutes long. Uh, it, a module would consist of maybe videos that are interactive, maybe some questions at the end, you know, the usual sort of stuff. But our videos were five minutes long, and the user session was around three and a half to four minutes. So we kind of stuck with it, and then we thought, well, actually, why don't we use this information to make a change. So lo and behold, in October 2017, we made the change, and then this is the impact that we saw. So we changed it so that no video is longer than three minutes. With any additional exercises, it's three and a half minutes at max. And that was, and, you know, there could be various other variables in here, but that was the only thing that we changed at that point. What we did is we matched that up with the actual qualitative feedback from our colleagues in terms of initially it was, oh, this is quite long, it's taking a long time, I'm losing interest. Even those same people are making the comments of like, this is much better, I can do it in a shorter amount of time, I can go on, you know, this bite-size learning if you like. So from the Google Analytics, this is probably one of the interesting things that's made the, the biggest impact to, to what we do. So the data that we're taking in and, and looking at it and going, actually, what, what changes can we make towards the, the sessions that we're putting out? Can we make it more impactful? Can it um, raise engagement, more people visiting the site, et cetera? So that was interesting, and that's continuing to go up. Um, this is just another indication of going from 2017 to 2018, the number of users has gone up, the number of sessions, the average session, three and a half, four minutes. It spiked recently over Christmas. I don't know what people were doing over Christmas. I do know that no one visited the site on Christmas Day which makes me feel a little bit happier. But all the other days, we can see that people are using it. So it's really interesting to see those things shift. And don't get me wrong, there are loads of other variables in there. But what we're finding is we're using the stuff off of Google Analytics and with the site and having good, imp good impact. And so after that, the other thing in terms of how we're using the data is actually around aligning it with a, a business goal. So in September this year, we... Uh, partnered up with uh, lock brand Hiplock. Our buyers came to us and said, look, we really want to um, push this brand out towards all the stores. We want to educate them so they can sell it. And they're saying features, benefits, and I'm saying that's great, but how are they actually going to use that information? So we created a, a module with Hiplock. We got them in. We used some of their content, but we created our own content with this. And it had two aims. One of the aims was introduce the brand and introduce the product but then also, how can a colleague sell this? What are the conversations they can have with a consumer? Can they show them how to lock their bike up? What type of lock they need with, with what bike? Why some are better than others? So not just, this is a feature, this is a benefit, off you go. And what we found was, and this is literally what we found, uh, when I looked at lock, hip lock sales, so I can go and speak to our buyers and say, tell me the hip lock sales, nothing really happened across the whole business. And I was like, ah, okay. 
Maybe I need to look a little bit deeper with this. So I went into it then and looked at it by store, and I looked at it by how many colleagues had completed the module. And what I found was when I looked at one, not really any difference, two, not really any difference, three. So the stores that had five or more colleagues or 25% of their workforce completed it, we started to see a shift. So we saw a small shift in hip lock sale quantities and a small shift in the value. What was really, really interesting, which we didn't really think about, was how it shifted locks in general. So what we found is the content that we were giving our colleagues not only gave them the confidence to sell the hip lock product, but actually it gave them more confidence to sell the, the whole range or the whole um, product group. So this kind of gives you a bit of an insight into actually what's the impact that we're having. So we're trying to match up two data sets here. And I'm not saying that one has 100% causality on the other. That would be probably wrong of me. But there's a definite strong correlation between the two. We also release this when our sales tend to drop off going into the winter months. So if anything, we'd have hoped for it to kind of plateau and remain the same. But we found that we were able to give it that shift. And a lot of this is through the feedback that we've got from our colleagues. And this brings me to the last bit, really, that I wanted to talk about. So we've got the data from the platform. We've got what we get from Google Analytics. That's helping us design better content. We're able to match that up with some uh, business goals and some business data. But what's really, really exciting for me is the conversations that I can now have with people within the organization. So within retail, they're heavily numbers driven. If anyone else works in retail, you know that everything tends to be on shifting that number higher unless it's, unless it's a cost. So I can now have more impactful conversations with our retail team and our retail director. I can have better conversations around if they want to introduce a new product. This is going to support the, um, the sales in that product. But what I can also do is have better conversations with some of our suppliers and other people within the business. Because what we're seeing is our um, usage of the site, that wasn't me, our usage of the site has, um, has raised up massively. And what we've got is around 85 to 90% of our retail colleagues are using the site. And they're going on every one to two weeks. So when I talk to our BNM team or I talk to a supplier and say, look, we want to put your content on here, I have quite confidence that it's going to get out to a lot of colleagues. So what we're starting to do is, is kind of talk the language. And I, I went back to um, that session yesterday on learning leadership. And actually, having that seat at the table, what I'm finding is you kind of need to talk the language in there. And as my experience of working in the l and profession is we're, we kind of shy away from the data. And I'm, I'm not that data-driven person, but I'm seeing its use and its benefit. And the big one for me is how I then go and talk to our regional managers or our store managers or our retail director and say, look, this is, this is what's kind of happening with, with our platform. This is what we're seeing from a sales perspective when we release content at the right time, depending on when the learner is going online. So, that, for me, is a really, really exciting bit. Um, I've yeah, hopefully covered some stuff off with you guys that's useful. I suppose the questions from me to you would be, so what is the information that your platform gives you at the moment? Is it enough? Do you need some more information? I mean, we literally plugged Google Analytics into ours, and it showed us a whole host. I, I need to learn a lot more with regards to that, but it's been fantastic. The other question is, so what data do you have available within your organization? Is any of that data going to be useful? And can you match that up with any of the data coming from your platform? And then the last thing is, think about the stakeholders that you want to talk to. Is this going to help you? And I, I imagine it probably will help you in terms of how you talk to them, the conversations that you have with them, and ultimately the language that you, you will then be able to engage with them. Thank you. Just in case, just in case you're wondering about format and structure for the session, we are I, we are building in a Q&A opportunity at the end, so you get an opportunity to uh, ask any of the speakers any of the questions that have arisen for you, and we'll be able to have a good 15, 20 minutes on that. So don't feel that you're missing out by us just jumping into the next speaker. Okay.
Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dr. Hannah Gore, and I head up the business school for a company called Solera, which is a software development and data analytics company that works for car insurance and software. So weirdly, you've never heard of us, but probably use us without even knowing about it. And I head up their business school, Neil got it slightly wrong, in 46 countries across 26 companies. It is a bit of a mouthful, though. He was close enough. I mean, you know, I'm sure my CEO would not be so happy if we lost 20 companies overnight. Um, so I'm here today to talk to you about data fueled learning, but in a different way. So as I'm talking, if you want to tweet me, uh, it's HR Gore, like Al Gore, um, but I use the DLR and not Air Force One. But I wanted to talk today in a different way, and I wanted to do a little bit of audience interaction before the carb coma kicks in. So could I get, she says, clicking the button wildly, a year in the room on three if any of you work in L and D? On one, two, three? Yep. Right, I'm in the right place. Okay. Can I get a hell yeah in the room if you're a total utter badass at L and D? <laughs> I kind of guessed that that was actually going to happen. And one of my friends went, but what happens if they all say hell yeah? I'm like, probably not. So we're very British, you know. Um, and this is the problem. And this is what I actually want to talk about. And I could talk to you all day about graphs and charts and all that kind of thing. And they are absolutely bloody fantastic. The problem is if you do not own it as a total and utter L&D badass, and you have to get comfortable with this, okay? It is no point at all. You can have the greatest charts and graphs in the room. You can have whizzy sort of interactives. You can sit there and go, this is fantastic. This is the shiniest report ever in the world of shiny reports. But the truth of the matter is, CEO, is he really going to pay attention? Is he going to really read that report and go, I get it. I get it. I'm not going to cut from L&D this year because it's the number one budget they always cut from. You know, I'm going to give them tons of money because this is the shiniest report in all of shiny reports. And the truth is, he's not. And the problem with that is, is because you really, really, really have to own it. You have to be able to go, this is incredible. This is life changing. We hold the key to the company being successful. And there's probably a couple of expletives going through your head along with, is she crazy? Yeah, probably slightly. Um, along with, dare I and can I? Because normally L&D people are absolutely lovely. And they don't necessarily start strutting around the place like they own the joint. We should. We absolutely should. And so it does come back to the, can I? Imposter syndrome problem. Can I honestly go up to my CEO and go, I'm the answer. Our department is the answer. This is what you need. And it is a really scary thing. And we all have it in us. And I have it in me. I mean, I was just sitting there, quietly bricking it, right before this presentation. Because that's what I do before every presentation. Um, and we all worry. Do I know enough? Can I be good enough at this? And the truth of the matter is, you know your company, you know your people, you know your curriculum, you know what you can offer, you know that you can actually make a difference. And the reason why you're in this role and not your CEO is because you know all of this. But your CEO does not know all of this because you have to tell them, you have to really show them what you've got. And it's back to kind of like a confidence thing. And, and it's the confidence of being able to go, yeah, we are the best. We are the best department in this company. We really are the most fantastic people that can help you drive your organization. Because an L&D department is actually the most powerful department in the whole company. You bring in people. You hire people if you work with HR. You can develop them into being the best people for that company. You can help drive strategy. You can make a company, and you can equally break a company with your L&D department. So you have a lot of power, a phenomenal amount. You just don't necessarily have the voice to do it. And sometimes people say, oh, it's, it's all right for you. You're super confident. Um, I sit on the SMT for my company. 
And I'm in meetings and they will say to me, we're rolling out as we are in a couple of weeks' time, new products in new countries. And the director of that country will turn to me and go, Hannah, what can we do about that? So I have a poll culture in my company. But a year ago, before I joined the company, we didn't even have an L&D department. We didn't buy in anything, we didn't have any L&D people, we didn't have any L&D content. And it was about creating my space at the table. Because at the end of the day, it's the L&D that will drive that company forward. It's the development of the staff that is going to hit those returns, that is going to get those sales, is going to create the better software. So you have to be confident in that. And as I said, that's really hard. And taking the famous saying, when life gives you lemons, do not hit your CEO with a baseball bat. Um, it's tough. It is really tough. And the only way to do it, and the way that I found to do it, is that you take on an alternative persona. So Beyonce is absolutely famed around the world. Her tickets are hundreds of pounds, and she's up there on the stage, fierce as anything. She really works the room. Everybody gets whipped up. It's exciting. Because her alter ego is Sasha Fierce. She is not Beyonce on stage. She talks about it quite widely. She is Sasha Fierce. When I'm at work, I'm Dr. Gore. When I'm at home, I'm Han. I bake things. I walk my dog. Um, I watch nice, fluffy TED Talks. But when I'm at work, I'm Dr. Hannah Gore. I know my stuff. I'm telling you how I can change a company. So if it means you have to adopt a persona to become the person that you need to become to stand in that room with that CEO and go, I can do this. We can do this. Our department can do this. If that's what it takes, then go for it. You know? I mean, Dr. Gore is quite a cool name, so I do get away with some stuff. But an alternative ego really does help build the confidence, because you can be the person you secretly really want to be in that room. And you can say, look, I make the difference. And the thing is, you can have all the data in the world. I mean, this guy had phenomenal amounts of data. He was known for the huge amounts of data that he had. And he used to stand on a stage in a black polo neck and talk about lifestyle and how he was going to change your life and how he was going to make the world a better place because we've got nice wheels that can spin music instead. And I bought one of the first ever iPods based purely on his speeches about how he was going to change my life with music. Uh, really did, actually. But he believed in the lifestyle change. He sold you that. He didn't sell you data. He didn't talk about how many clicks went through anything. He talked about the end goal, the end vision. And so it's really good when you're talking with a CEO, with a managing director, with your boss, about the end goal, the end vision, the lifestyle of the company that you can bring with L&D. Not necessarily do they always want to hear, oh, we've got a new course. Great. What's it going to do for the company? How is it going to develop the staff? Talk about the lifestyle that you can actually bring to your company, the amount of knowledge that it's then going to reap back to them. So you kind of have to become salespeople. And I do work for a sales company. and I do come from originally a sales background. But this is what you've got to talk about. You've got to talk about the life-changing things. Because as I said, you run it. You run the company, not the CFO, not the CEO, not anyone like that. You do. And the thing is, how many people here work, I'm guessing, for a company? Fab. That's good. That's a good start. Uh, how many people here have gone and found their five-year strategy, pulled it apart, and looked at how L&D can save that company? And that's the difference. So you've got to stop being a reactive department. You're not a nice-to-have department that's down a dusty corridor. You are the best thing that this department, this company has ever had. You've got to be more proactive. You've got to look at that five-year strategy, unpack it, and go, this is how I can make L&D work for this company. This is the areas of problems. We can see that you want to expand in these different areas. OK, so how do we develop the staff to do that? How do we attract in the right staff to do that? How do we then take it forward? How do we get, for example, my objective in my company has absolutely nothing to do with L&D. My sole objective in my company is to deliver double-digit growth in salespeople. How the hell am I going to do that if I'm not talking about how L&D is going to transform those people to become really great salespeople to get double-digit growth? So you have to go, find the strategies, find the missions, and then start explaining to the CEOs how you 
can help those strategies, help those missions. Work on getting a place at the SMT top table. I have a place there, and as I said, people will ask me, how do I help? What can the business school do for us? And create a pull culture, and stop making it a push culture. Because when you're a push culture, the problem with that is you get cut very quickly in times of austerity. They always go, oh, it's nice to have. They always say, oh, you know, off you go, once a year, talk about personal development as part of your annual appraisal. In my company, we talk about L&D every week. Every week, our managers from our learning platform, we use Bridge, get a weekly email about how their staff are performing. Every week that a member of staff submits to a checkpoint inside the business school, it's their manager that signs them off. Not me, not the business school. Because the manager has to explain how that member of staff is performing. That manager has to explain how they presented to a client, how they closed that deal. So what happens is we're creating this L&D socialism. So it's now the manager's problem just as much as it's my problem that that member of staff is performing. And every single week they get a report and then they can go to the member of staff, well, how are you doing on this course? And it's no longer an annual conversation, it's a weekly conversation. And then we have train the trainers. So we have staff in the companies that are the best ones that we can find and they train other people to be the best people within the company. And then we've made all of the area directors and MDs ambassadors for the business school. So we've changed something from what is a down the corridor conversation once a year to something that is in the company throughout every single person. Because L&D, once it resides in the whole company, you can't get away from it. Everyone's having the L&D conversation. And then you start owning the power of that pull. And she says, click really hard. And it's all down to you. You are the ones that can do that. Your CEO is not going to wake up tomorrow and go, this is the answer. Because they've never experienced it before. So you've got to work with them and push really hard. And like I said, alter egos help phenomenally to do this. So the way to do it is to badass your brand is to go back and find the strategies, the documents, the mission statements. Find where this company is going. Find how you can help deliver that company to that point. Become the point that your CEO now can't live without you. You are no longer the department at the end of the corridor that nobody knows. You are the person that everybody knows. Absolutely everybody. I mean, it does come with a caveat that your inbox does get a lot busier that your phone does ring a bit more, but it actually leads to better results. And it actually leads to conversations constantly about L&D and people coming up to you going, can I have a course on this? Can I have a course on that? Can we have bite-sized learning on this and a webinar on that? And they're actually now excited about learning because it's all part of them. And so, clicking, that's the key. Every single day. You're not a one-off, you're not an annual, you're not a fairy on top of a Christmas tree. You are the best thing that happens to a company every day. And then you can go to your CEO with the best reports that you've ever had, with the shiny spreadsheet since the dawn of time. And at that point, your CEO will finally actually understand what all those spreadsheets mean, what is the narrative to that story, because they are part of it every day too. So that is me. That is what I was here to talk about. Welcome to Tweet Me, Socially Stalk Me at any time. Happy to carry on conversations about it. But as L&D people, I always feel the one thing that is always missing at conferences is about how to develop L&D people. You know, it's not just about this is a nice shiny thing that worked for me and this is a really great thing that worked for me. It's about, well, how do I take it back? How do I own it? How do I then deliver it for my company? And that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. Thank you. These are my kind of speakers, and I'll tell you why. Every one of them came in under time, which is fantastic. And we got some quality content out of that. I'm sure that amongst what those three fantastic speakers had to share with you, that may have sparked some thoughts for you. It may have sparked some ideas. And we'll talk at the end about how you're going to bridge this back into actionable insights that you're going to take back into the workplace. What are you going to do differently with that? And I'll give you uh, some time to talk about that. 
But we're now in the situation where we've got a little bit of breathing space and we can start to take some questions. So if you've got any questions for any of the speakers, they're already mic'd up. If you have a question, please put your hand up. We've got a microphone that can rotate that end of the room, and I'll do this end of the room, and um, I'll moderate as we go. So I've seen two hands down this end. Have you got any there at the moment? Right, so person nearest me. And who are you? Um, hi, Matt Johnston, soon to be badass L&D professional. Cheers. The <laughs> um, question for Nick is, um, with analytics, is there a danger that if you don't see the results that you anticipate, that you'll filter them enough so that you do see the results that you're looking for? Oh, interesting. I, I, there's been a, I've had a background on this one. I've had a little bit in our department where we actually managed to prove that the LMS will make you fail if okay. you look deep enough at the results. So how would you mitigate against that as a department and as an individual? Uh, that's a very interesting one. So I haven't filtered anything, by the way. I, I put everything up there as it is. But um, I'm not sure I necessarily know the answer to that right now. Um, I, I think there has to be a huge amount of integrity in what you do anyway. Uh, I've got no challenge if we produce something that doesn't work. If it doesn't work, there's no point in, in it happening anyway. So I'd probably welcome knowing how to go that far into it in terms of the detail. I'm still learning on the whole analytics side of things. Um, and if something's not working and it's failing, I'd probably want to know that. And I think, you know, we probably all don't want to put stuff out that, that, that doesn't function, doesn't work. So I don't know the answer to that. But if I did find it, then I'd stop doing that. I suppose is my, my answer to that. Does that, does that answer it? Yeah, no, that's yeah. cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Um, thanks for the presentation. Uh, my name is Nick Ribeiro. I'm on Twitter on at Mr. Minicky. Um, this is a real brain dump reflection. Might lead to a question. Don't know. So I'm <laughs> fascinated at the moment by the whole idea of open data. And I would encourage people to look at the Open Data Institute, which is talking about looking at government data sets, for example, being able to draw that information in to get insights that might actually um, help you drive a business or common solutions or something like that. Um, I've attended sessions about data, and um, I think the challenge that I find is that, um, you know, we've been talking about business intelligence has been a term we've used for years, but learning's never been part of business intelligence. So why is that? Um, why are we separating learning from business intelligence? Um, also, the question around people are very reluctant to free their data up whether it's structured or unstructured. So even if you use SQL, people will say, well, the data's not even right. So there's not even a data strategy to support all this. So it's, it's so many things. We talk about data-driven, and yet the company's not ready for it. They don't have a strategy. Their data's all over the place. And we haven't even started to talk about XAPI or any API. Um, so that was a real brain dump. And I don't know if there's anything that you can bounce back off that one. Sure. I'm happy to take that. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll stand because I'm short. Um, <laughs> so I'm just looking up at you anyway. Um, I think what you're saying, yeah, the data is everywhere. Um, we, we have to accept that. I mean, I was pulling data from probably 40 different sources, disparate sources, and it wasn't clean. And the way that I went around it was basically just to go to different areas and say, what data do you already currently collect? And can I have a copy? And I'll anonymize it. Um, and it, it's messy, but that was just simply simply what we, 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 had to, we had to do. And and I think that's the only place we can start until we get what I would love to see, which is an internet of things that L&D is plugged into, you know, where we're getting data automatically from other places. The, you know, like, but again, I think that's, that's aspirational. Um, regarding XAPI, um, for somebody who loves data, I actually hate it. And the, the reason why is I think why we made something that's so difficult to construct when I can put the same content on a Squarespace account and I can get all of the data feeds that I need without having to code anything. So that's my, my two cents on, on, on that um, because I, I just think it's easier. Hannah, Nick, anything to add? I, I think the only thing to add is that sometimes we collect data as L&D people based on what we want to collect data on inside L&D. And the problem with that is it doesn't always necessarily align with what the company is expecting, needing, or wanting 
not through a fault of our own, but again, because we don't have a seat always at the top table, about the alignment. So, for example, you can talk about, you know, this is the data, these are how the courses work, and this is how many clicks, this is how long a, a, a video should be, et cetera, et cetera. But then your CFO is going, okay, so, so what does that mean for the bottom line? And there's like this gap between one side of the company and the other side of the company, understanding what data <coughs> could be found, how it could be translated into information, and we are the people that can translate that into information to then express the other side, what does that mean for your reports, for the CFO, the CEO, et cetera. And I think once that conversation starts to happen, it does get easier, but it's a hard conversation to have. Thank you. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm picking up from that uh, and tying it back to um, Trish Yule's session yesterday was about the amount of data that we've probably already got, but tends to be backward looking, but it's how we can move further up that curve and actually turn that data into being more forward looking and predictive and, and driving action. So I'm just trying to bridge those two things together on, on, on the basis of that. Um, any other questions for, for our speakers? Gentlemen here, anybody over there? I will take the one from over there and I'll come back to you. Hi. <coughs> Excuse me, this is my throat. Um, hi, my name's Jonathan. Uh, I'm American, so I, I was going to say hell yes, and then I realized no one else was going to, <laughs> so I... Uh, <laughs> you would have been my only badass if you had. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I don't know that I'm a badass, though, but... Um, so, uh, I, I think the challenge that I have sometimes with data is, um, I've used it in a couple projects in different companies, and one time was an employee engagement survey, and so I was partnering directly with the person that managed the HRIS system, so it meant that we had to have all the data, because in order to properly filter people and build reports and understand everything, we, there was literally no way to even do the project. Um, and it had the buy-in of the SVP of HR and, and, and everyone above from that. So that was no problem to get that level of filtering and, and not have to worry about it being anonymous. But generally speaking, like you said, you have to anonymize the data. Um, and I find, I guess I wonder what, how do you know when you're working on analytics for learning projects and things like this, um, which slices are essential? Because obviously with GDPR and other things, there's concerns there, but even leaving all that out, gender, pay, you know, like pay banding because you have different types of jobs and certain things and, you know, all these different things. How do you, how do you make those educated decisions about which slices are, are most relevant? Were you aiming that question at any particular? Really speaker? anybody, because anybody. I know a couple of people. Yeah. Do you want to dive in, guys? I can. <laughs> Um, I think one of the, the big things, um, when this was at a project that I was working at a bank, about um, 95,000 people, and we really erred on the side of caution. Like, we wanted just, just aggregate data. So the first thing we did is we removed any outliers. So we had one poor chap who, who worked in Hong Kong, so we'd be like, we knew everything that was going on in Hong Kong, so we just eliminated him from, from everything, because we could tell it was him, right? So there was no anonymization. Um, so, we, so we got rid of him. Um, anything to do with, with gender, age, any of that, we, we stripped all of that. We, we kept it just purely geographically, business unit, um, because I think there's, there's, there's a risk. I, I would just rather err on the side of caution. I think there's a risk between getting getting precise and then getting creepy. And what's the benefit to me knowing um, some, some of these, some of these, these things? Um, uh, what I'd also say too is that we did make some assumptions based on that, like based on, on uh, job grade, which we did keep. You could sometimes extrapolate who was earlier in their career, perhaps younger. Um, but again, that's fuzzy, fuzzy data and you have to be comfortable with that. But I think any, getting too precise is, is, is leaving you exposed. Thank you, Nick. Hannah. Um, I suppose for us, I mean, we've—I haven't got the time to go into that amount of detail, and probably wouldn't really necessarily understand a lot of it or how to get there. So, um, I think for us, what we've done is like this is a constant learning process for us. So we're we're looking at the data. There's so much of it. We're working with other people in the business to go right. Actually, what what's important? What are we trying to do with this session that we've put out? Um, trying to use different people to have their insight. It, it's, 
it's kind of a learning process at the same time. And what we're finding is that the more we dive into it and embrace it, we're finding that actually it's, it's been more and more beneficial. So, I, yeah, for me, I haven't necessarily got the time and the, the knowledge yet, but hopefully I might get there. Um, the data that, I mean, obviously we gather all the usual data about completion rates and engagement, but also surveys and <coughs> qualitative data. I mean, do not underestimate the power of chatting to somebody and gathering their thoughts and feedback on the learning. And I don't mean in like a kind of happy sheet at the end, I mean in like an actual chat with a cup of tea and a biscuit. Um, and that has really helped us scope. Our business school is very organic. It is very um, proactive, but also reactive to the needs of the company. So it moves constantly. Um, so we haven't got one set rule. This is how it's going to be. It changes due to the company needs. Um, and we get that from data. But as I said, it is a combination of the usual stats and statistics and survey results and clicks and but also what the people are telling us that they need, um, which you don't always get from just looking at click data, so to speak. Yeah, thank you. And that goes to the piece about owning it, doesn't it? Exactly that. Gentleman over here had a question. Hi, uh, Andy Lewis at Next Retail. So um, I've got a date in the calendar next week as a kickoff meeting with the data analytics department. <laughs> so uh, looking forward to that. Um, so I think my question to you guys is, do you go in with the question of what can your data tell me or can your data tell me this and how your conversation grows from there? Uh, I, I can tell you how I went about it. Um, I looked at all the data that I had and it's only over a period of time that I kind of worked out well, what is this telling me like what could that possibly be telling me and I, as I'm looking at it as a whole and I believe me I don't delve into a lot of detail on, on the Google Analytics but when I'm looking at that I'm having a conversation with some of the people on my floor and it's great because all of a sudden I've got a common interest with these people that I never probably would have spoken to before and it's fantastic so I'm asking them they're getting all excited about it they're telling me what that means or potentially what it means I then tell them that our bounce rate is really low and they're like, oh my God, that's amazing. And I'm like, fantastic. So I, I suppose I took what was available to me and then from that I've gone in and, and tried to get some advice from people um, as opposed to going, give me this information. Mm -hmm. does, that, does that answer it? Yeah. For me, I usually just, it, it's an iterative process. Um, you know, I, I tell them what I'm looking for, is that possible? But then also to any, any data analyst I've worked with, will, well, they love it <laughs> if you find one who's really good. And they'll start making correlations that you're like, oh, I didn't even, I didn't even think of that. And keeping in mind, we were using really disparate data. I mean, I was even using the data from when people clicked uh, or tapped their cards to come into buildings between when the cafeteria is most busy, just trying to get this, this, this picture. Um, and they, they found some really unique correlations. Um, so, so I just keep it as an open conversation, have fun. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, any data person loves it. I yep. mean, it's manna from heaven at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, understand the narrative that you think you're going to be telling is kind of important. It's not always the narrative you end up with. Mm -hmm. But also talk to them about the vision that you want. Because in the vision that you want, they will tell you the type of data you need to collect to get that, to prove mm -hmm. it, disprove it, or show where you need to go. And that is just as important as the story you want to tell about today is the one that you want to tell about tomorrow. So understand kind of like the chasm that's going to sit in between, and then that will start to shape your strategy about how you're going to get there. Feel well armed for that conversation now? <laughs> Brilliant. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, there's a couple of things that occur to me uh, out of this in terms of, and I really like... I, I've never met these guys before, particularly other than our preamble for, for um, doing this session today. I've learned so much in the last couple of days about data and data analytics, and I'm reassured that actually a lot of what I think I would need, I'm not in the corporate world myself, I don't run a department, I don't report to anybody particularly, but I could now, with a degree of confidence, know where to go and start looking for stuff, be curious enough to go and um, discover stuff like this. 
and then worry about what it was I was going to do with it later. But I think it's also clear to me there are other people in the organisation, and I think this is a thing for learning and development generally. We need to get our heads out of our own silos. We need to be talking to the business, working in partnership with the business, talking to the people that have the kind of information that we could be helping them to leverage and return real business benefit. So that's kind of my takeaway, which is my bridge into inviting you now to think about your bridge. What are you going to take away from this? What's your actionable insight? Now, there's a couple of ways you could do this. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to have a conversation with somebody next to you or around your table or whatever. But I would invite you to look at it in terms of you're committing to some kind of action here. There's so much good stuff coming out of these sessions that the, we really want you to go away and make a difference with this stuff. So do that around your table, do it in pairs. Equally, if you're feeling a little, you're not quite ready to commit, then remember the hashtag LT19UK and this session hashtag, which is hashtag T2S5. You can always tweet it after the event. Be brave. Put it out there publicly. And then you'll have to be accountable. Because, and if you want to track back on anything that these great people have talked about today, look at the hashtag. Follow the hashtag back. There will be ongoing conversation and dialogue about this. So I'd love to see your bridging commitments show up in that hashtag stream. And then you can do things like stick it in a wakelet and you've got your blog already written for you. Take a couple of minutes, have your conversation, and then we'll just do a very quick wrap up. Thank you. Two minutes. All right, your two minutes are up. If you haven't got one yet, I expect to see it on Twitter using the hashtag hash t 2 s 5 at some point. Ladies and gentlemen, we're done. Thank you so much for your time and attendance. Can you please show your appreciation to our three fantastic speakers, Laurie Niles, Nick Coley, Dr. Hannah Gore.